So it was 1986 in Marion, South Carolina. I was 13, which is never a good thing. <laughs> no, think, think back, kids. It's no, not a good thing. I was at a pool party at the Thomas's house, surrounded by my parents and all their friends. It was hot and humid. The sun beat down. You can imagine the fashionable country club attire. Think J.C. Penney. <laughs> the men drank beer or whiskey. The women drank wine coolers. Bartles and James. <laughs> I was the only kid standing around with the adults. The younger kids were thrashing around in the pool while the, while the two Thomas girls tried to organize them into a game of Marco Polo. The other kids my age, other boys, had gone next door to Jason's house to play video games. This shift to the other house, without me, was negotiated with very few words. I wasn't not invited, but I wasn't invited either. I didn't mind being left. I knew I was different from them. I didn't know how I was different exactly, but I didn't want them to feel weird. Now that they were gone, all I had to do was avoid talking to all the adults. I planted myself by the food table, refilling my little paper plate over and over again with snacks. The closest adult to me and the food table was my dad. He was close enough to me that I didn't look so alone, and I was far enough from him that I didn't have to join the adults' conversation. This balance among all the actors on the stage didn't last. Here came Mr. Tim, a local lawyer with a puffy pink face and a pink polo shirt. He looked like an agitated, preppy pig. <laughs> Tim leaned over the table to pour himself another Jim Beam. He gave my dad a stagey wink. You aren't keeping count on me there, are you, Art? He said and laughed loudly. He looked around for someone to laugh with him. <laughs> dad took a slow moment to grab a handful of peanuts, gave me a quick eye roll as he turned with his smiling objection. Oh, now, Tim. See, like me, my dad was different. He was different because he was the minister. Or, as he was more commonly called in Marion, South Carolina, population 8,000, the preacher. The Presbyterian preacher. Most people in Marion in the 1980s saw morality and religion in simple, stark terms. Most, not all the people, but most of these folks were absolutely positive that God didn't like fags or sluts or Christmas lights in any other color than white. <laughs> they were equally certain that, do, that God did like guns and the death penalty and social segregation. It had only been 15 years at that point since the schools were integrated, after all. Yeah. In this world where God had simple cut and dried standards for his creatures, great and small, a preacher's role was simple. It was a criminal justice job. He was the world enforcer for our Lord and Savior, God's cop. This kind of preacher kept score with a naughty and nice list, just like that other power-tripping rich bitch, Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> he's, the, he's the worst. He's the worst. <laughs> I can tell you all about it later. He's the worst. I hate Santa Claus. Um, Late-stage sta late capitalism. Um, it is hard to connect and make friends or to even relax for a preacher in a fishbowl-sized town like this when people think you're there, that you're sitting in judgment of their every action. And this view of my dad as God's cop was, e was extra tough for my dad because it wasn't accurate. That was not and still is not him. He did his work in the church like a true Christian. He helped people. He wasn't in it for the attention or power. He grew up in the 1960s with liberation theology and the shameless hope of that generation. He chose to be a minister because Christianity had a new opportunity to push change. In that moment at the pool, I saw his local loneliness and it looked a whole lot like my own. Also, dad didn't look like or act like most of the local dads. He didn't drink much, and he ran road races, so he didn't have the big, laid-back, beer belly attitude like a lot of the other dads. He rode a bicycle up and down Main Street in Marion from the church to visits to people from our church who were in the hospital or to people's houses in this town where the only reason anyone would ever ride a bike was because they couldn't afford a car. Dad's car was a cool 1960s British MGB not a pickup truck or an Acura. He had a mustache, which was more unique in the 80s than it had been in the 70s. In a small town, the kids' identities are closely related to their parents. As the preacher's kids, my brother, sister, and I showed up with that, that goody-goody sheen, that cloying specialness that only teachers like. 
The adults' hesitation to let their guard down socially with a preacher was e echoed in their kids' attitudes towards us. Don't worry, all three of us found our way to underage, underage drinking, but there were a lot of kids who held us at arm's length like their parents held my dad and also my, our mom, the preacher's wife. That fall, I started seventh grade. Oh, I know. <laughs> thanks, thanks. <laughs> Yours is awkward too, I'm sure. I wanted to be with the cool kids, so I tried to get close to the guys in eighth grade. One year's difference was a big deal in, in, at that age. The eighth grade guys were bigger, stronger, smarter, and magnetic to me in a deep down kind of way that I didn't understand, or if I did, I didn't admit to myself what that attraction was really about. <laughs> I wanted some of that fake Mormon love. Where's Jen? <laughs> some, of that, some of that fake Mormon love. Okay. Um, <laughs> Besides the cool guys in my seventh grade class were not trying to join my little D&D &D group to play Dungeons and Dragons or include me in whatever it was that they did. At Jonathan Junior High, recess was rough. It meant kids standing around on a wide expanse of uninterrupted asphalt, very clearly arranged in literal social circles of each specific social group. Everybody just stood around with the people who wanted to stand around with them. If you didn't fit well into a group, there was nowhere to be. One day on the asphalt, as I stood close as I could to the group of cool eighth grade guys and tried to join their conversation, Julie Grice pulled me to the side. Julie was in my class, and her cousin Ruiz was in the group of eighth grade boys. Julie had her bangs frozen up in that iconic, crunchy, diaphanous floof of the day. <laughs> I watched, <laughs> yeah, if you're old enough, you know. I watched Julie's bangs while her mouth said that Ruiz and the guys asked her to tell me that they didn't want me to hang out around them anymore. She was pretty nice about it. It was clear that she pitied me, but I could tell she enjoyed being the messenger. <laughs> I didn't look over to where they were all standing about five feet away, so I never knew if they were watching me be banished by the big bangs. <laughs> After that, I spent most recess periods in the library, I wondered if my dad were more like the other dads, if he was loud and went to Ducks Unlimited meetings, if these older guys I thought were so great would like me. But even in those most self-obsessed and self-pitying days of adolescence, I knew the truth. My misfit status was at least 90% my own doing. I was willing to ditch the few friends I had, and I had targeted the wrong people to be my new friends. And my dad was a really good dad. My brother and I wanted to play soccer, but there was no soccer, just football. In Marion, soccer was different suspicious, European. <laughs> so my dad and a few other dads started a soccer league for us. And while Ronald Reagan was going crazy building nuclear missiles, dad took my brother and me to the rare anti-war rally in the next town. We thought it was hilarious when the good old boys driving by on the highway heckled us with, more nukes, less kooks. My dad's other startup was a dirt cheap thrift store, the clothing closet in an empty storefront in downtown Marion so that there was a way for low-income people to buy clothes. Dad ran for the local school board, won, and then became board president. We went with him to the gospel churches all over town where it was normal for politicians to come and give a stump speech during worship and where we thought it was cool to be the only white faces in the place. I wasn't aware of it then, but I was witnessing him invent a good full life for himself and his family and help other people in town instead of always trying to fit in to what was there. My dad's books opened up the crazy, the crazy, wide, rambling world outside of Marion. He kept most of his books in his office in the church, just down the block on Main Street from our house, which the church people called the Pastor's Manse. Along with plenty of theological books, Dad had all his paperback fiction. He let me take anything I wanted. Kurt Vonnegut, Philip Roth, Toni Morrison, Catch-22, Cry the Beloved Country. I got to know my dad's mind, his curiosity, and his worldview from these books. Dad could be poli politically pessimistic, and bury my heart at Wounded Knee helped me see where that might come from. I read all of his Kurt Vonnegut books when I was 11 or 12. He probably had about, about 10 of them. Those wild stories blew my mind and made me want to be a writer. Vonnegut's book, Breakfast of Champions, taught me that there are two kinds of beaver. <laughs> they were right there in the book, sketched and penned by the, by the author Vonnegut himself. And when I was done, back on the shelf in the preacher's office, the book went. I imagined my dad reading these books, laughing and enjoying the naughtiness, drama, history, and heroism within. It was the winter after that pool party when I saw that, in addition to being different in our different ways in this small town, my dad the preacher had the same need for friendship that I did. My dad's best friend in town died. Dad had 
lots of friends who lived in other places, college friends, other liberal, wisecracking ministers. And Mary and his list of good friends seemed pretty short, just like mine. Ronnie Rice was a high school teacher and the assistant football coach. He and Dad led the church youth group. Everybody loved Coach Rice. He smoked a pipe and was a brash, wise ass like a football coach should be. Together, Dad and Coach Rice organized games and service projects for the church teenagers. With my mom and a few other brave adults, they took the old church van full of squirrely teenagers on ski trips and the summer youth camp and to the summer youth camp in the North Carolina mountains. Being Coach's minister, it was Dad's job to plan the funeral. In the week between his friend's death and the service, Dad planned everything with Coach Rice's family while knowing he may be too upset to lead the service himself. He recruited another minister in town to do most of the talking. After the service in the packed church on Main Street, the cars lined up behind the hearse to drive across town to the cemetery. Once the 300 people or so in the crowd were settled, Dad stood up to do his part by saying a prayer. He tried really hard to get through those words. He started, choked, and stopped. He started again, got a little further, and then stopped again. Without being able to finish the prayer, he said thank you and sat back down beside my mom. We the kids were sitting in the row behind him. I watched his back in his dark suit, shaking as he cried, then growing still and taller as he got control of his emotions. I'd seen my father cry before. In our family and in his work, he was not afraid to let his emotions show. But this was different. There in the cemetery, I watched him say goodbye to a rare good friend. I felt what he was giving up because it was something that I really wanted for myself. In that moment, I saw my dad in a way I had not before, as a person just like me. Seeing him as a person instead of this character who did amazing things because he was dad made me realize the things he did, the way he lived, were possible for me too. He had been his own person in this place and put himself out there to make the whole town better. I understood. I didn't have to choose between a place and myself. I could be myself and create the home I wanted wherever I happened to be. Thanks. That was Hunter Gatewood. Up next.